Today, I want to talk about, in fact, I want to do some storytelling. I want to talk about another Old Testament character that maybe you've heard a story, maybe you haven't. But the truth is, it's going to relate to all of us, whether you have been to church your whole life or today is your first day ever. Because the guy I'm going to talk to, or talk to you about, I'm not going to talk to him, he's no longer with us, but the guy that I'm going to talk about, his story might just be like yours. The deal is that it was other people that caused him so much pain. And he was mistreated. He was hurt. And it left him broken. But as Joseph found out, just like you and I find out, that when we feel broken, we actually find out we are okay. Why? Because God, just like he was with Joseph, God is with you. In the first week, we talked about the words of Jesus. The second week, we talked about Jonah. The third week, we talked about Job. And today, we're going to talk about Joseph. Now, to find Joseph's story, you got to go to Genesis. That's the first book in the Bible. It's the first book in the Old Testament. And actually, we find out that so many chapters are actually devoted to Joseph. In fact, his story picks up in chapter 37, and it goes all the way to chapter 50, all the way to chapter 50. You know, in this series, we've talked about how life is messy and people are messy. And it's easy oftentimes to see your mess and forget about our mess. And this series has been address the mess. What does God want us to do? God wants us to address the mess. Well, today I want to I want to bring to you this message, this talk. It's entitled, Beautiful Mess. Beautiful Mess. There's beauty and it's brutal. As Pastor Ed Young says, brutal, right? Because it's beautiful, but it's brutal. And maybe that's part of your story. Part of your story is beautiful. Part of your story is brutal. It is brutal. And yet in the whole story, God being up here, God sees from beginning to end. He sees every moment. And sometimes where you and I get stuck in a moment, where we get stuck in a season, where we get depressed, where we get bogged down, where we get bitter because of this season, God sees from beginning to end. And he sees from end to beginning. And he knows the purpose, and he knows the plans that he has for you. And so God goes to the end, which is his purpose, and God works backwards. I love that. Let's take a look now at the life of Joseph. So in Genesis 37, we pick up, we start reading about Jacob. And we pick up on his story. And Jacob has 12 sons. He has 12 sons, and one of them is Joseph. And Joseph is given to him, right? Our children are a gift from God. Um, Jacob is blessed with his son, Joseph. And he's blessed at an old age. And so he loves, he loves Joseph. And then he, he has his very last son, which is Benjamin. Now, Joseph and Benjamin were, were from their mom, Rachel. And and she could only have two children, two sons. And Jacob loved these boys. Man, did he love them. God had given them in his old age. Now he had, imagine this, 12 sons. Imagine having 12 sons. In fact, when Steph and I were dating, uh, engaged, I asked Stephanie, we were talking about kids. And, you know, I asked her, I said, how many, how many kids do you want? And Stephanie said, five boys. I want five boys. And it wasn't long after that until, till Stephanie was like, you know, maybe, maybe two or three kids would be amazing. But Jacob had a, he had a, he had a team. He had two teams is what he had. And he had all these sons. Now, Joseph being a teenager, Joseph worked 
for his half-brothers. He had all these half-brothers, and he began to work for them. They were shepherds. They would go out, and they would take care of their father's sheep. And Joseph, being a teenager, he was 17, Joseph was working. Young people, you know what? It's good to work. I hope you have a great work ethic. In fact, um, one of the greatest things that you can do right now as a young person is learn to work hard. And Joseph was a hard worker. But Joseph was hated by his brothers. Oh, he was hated. They despised him. Why did they despise him? Well, for a couple reasons. Number one, they weren't stupid. They could see that their father, Jacob, favored Joseph. Hey, parents, there's a lesson here. If we have a favorite, if we favor one of our kids over the rest of our kids, it's going to cause jealousy. Favoritism always causes jealousy, and it's wrong. So mom and dad, we have to be bigger than that. Our kids are all different. They have different personalities. No kid is the same. In fact, if you have a couple kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, they can be completely opposite. And so, even though they're opposite, though we have to love them differently to meet them where we're at, we have to love them the same. Did you catch that? We have to love each child differently according to their needs, but we love them the same. We don't love one more than the other. And so uh, Joseph received a gift because his dad loved him so much more than the other brothers. He made him a robe. He made him a coat of many colors and he gave it to Jacob, and Jacob loved that robe. He loved that coat, and the brothers, oh, it just ticked them off even more. And then it didn't help out, uh, didn't help matters out that Joseph was given dreams. Now, God is a dream giver, and God gave Joseph dreams, and Joseph being young and being naive, he didn't know how to handle it. And sometimes when we're young, right, sometimes we, we, we don't know how to handle things. And Joseph didn't know how to handle that. So what does he do? He goes to his brothers and he says, man, I had these dreams. The first dream is there's these bundles and, and we're all out there working in the field. And we're working on our bundles and all of a sudden my bundle pops up and then your bundles pop up and they bow down to my bundle. That was the first dream as a teenager. And he just shared it with them. And they got ticked. They're like, are you telling us? You telling us we're going to bow down to you? Well, if that wasn't bad enough, Joseph has another dream. And in his second dream, here's what happens. All of a sudden, there's the sun, and there's the moon, and there's the stars. And they all bow down to Joseph. And Joseph tells his not only his brothers about this dream, but Joseph makes sure that he tells his entire family about this dream. And when Jacob hears the dream, you know what happens? Jacob scolds Joseph. And he says, am I and your mother and all of your brothers, are we all going to bow down to you? And scripture says that his brothers hated him even more. They hated him so much that they could never even speak one kind word to him. But it wasn't long after Joseph telling them that dream that the truth is that that dream made his father, Jacob, curious, but it made his brothers jealous, made him jealous. And so one day, one day Joseph was sent by Jacob to go check on his brothers. They were watching over their flocks, their sheep. They were tending to them. And Jacob said to Joseph, go check on your brothers, make sure they're okay, take them some stuff, come back and give me a heads up on how they're doing. Well, Joseph goes out to find his brothers. Now, here's another piece of the story that you need to know. Not only did Joseph have the coat that the other brothers didn't have. Not only was he favored above all the other brothers, but Joseph from time to time would tell his father, Jacob, 
He would report to his father when his brothers were doing wrong, and they couldn't stand that. Oh, man, they hated their brother. And so now one day, here comes Joseph to check on them, and they see Joseph coming, and they're like, this is our chance. Let's kill him. Let's kill him so we no longer have to put up with him. And that's what they decided to do. And then all of a sudden, Reuben, Reuben speaks up and Reuben says, no, guys. He says, we can't do this. He says, let's not kill him. He says, let's throw him in a cistern. Now, there was a cistern. It was a deep hole in the ground. Normally, you would have a cistern for water, right? It would become a well, but there was no water in this cistern. And so, they literally threw him. I can imagine them roughing him up, and they throw him down into the cistern. And don't you know, don't you know, it was dark, it was cold, it was scary. And they throw him in there, And Reuben says, why should we shed any blood? And then the brothers continued talking. And and meanwhile, Joseph is pleading for his life before they throw him in there. And then, then he goes silent. In fact, Joseph is a picture of Christ. Remember, remember when Jesus was taken in front of his enemies before he was crucified and he didn't he didn't say a word he went quiet now joseph goes quiet and the brothers decide let's sell him um you know some brothers saying let's let's kill him and then some brothers said no let's sell him in fact judah all of a sudden judah speaks up and he says hey if we kill him you're saying kill him reuben didn't want to kill him reuben's like hey let's throw him in here then we can kill him but reuben all along had planned on coming back and rescuing him out of that pit and bringing him back to their father Well, now all the brothers are arguing. I mean, that's what brothers do, right? They argue and they're arguing. Let's kill him. He deserves it. He's so whatever. Maybe they thought he was cocky. Maybe they thought he was privileged, but they were like, let's just kill him. And all of a sudden, Judah speaks up and says, hey, what are we going to gain? Let's at least get something out of it. And sure enough, here comes a caravan of camels and they sell Joseph to Ishmaelites who are headed to Egypt and they sell him for 30 pieces of silver. So they all got some coin. They all benefited from the mistreatment of their brother. And now Joseph is headed to Egypt with people he doesn't even know. When Joseph gets to Egypt, all of a sudden, Joseph is... Um, not alone. In fact, I wanted to read this verse to you because you know sometimes when life seems like it's spinning out of control, it it, it um, seems like God isn't even there, right? But we're gonna see picking up in chapter thirty nine that even though even though things spin out of control, even though things get worse, even though things go from bad to worse, we realize that there's one thing that never changes, and that is that it's a beautiful mess. Why? Because God is with him. Now, Potiphar, Potiphar meets Joseph, and Potiphar is Pharaoh's guy. He is his guy. He is, I mean, he is powerful. He is, he is, he is um, Pharaoh's guy. Now, who's, who's Pharaoh? Pharaoh was the king of Egypt, but they looked to Pharaoh as God. I mean, literally as God Almighty, but there's only one God Almighty, and we're going to talk about him all through this story. And so now Potiphar brings Joseph in, and Joseph is scrubbing floors, and he's taking care of Potiphar's house. But Scripture says that Potiphar had a wife who had something for Joseph. And Joseph, the, the Bible tells us that Joseph was strong and he was handsome. And so Potiphar's wife, while well, Potiphar is at work, taking care of the king of Egypt, Pharaoh. Potiphar's wife is flirting with Joseph. 
And more than one occasion, she demands that Joseph sleep with her. And lust is screaming, yes, but Joseph says no. Just a little application here for all of us. You know, none of us are beyond lust. None of us are beyond temptation. And it's not wrong to be tempted. It's wrong to do wrong. And Joseph, no doubt, was tempted. He was a man. I mean, she was a beautiful woman. I mean, Pharaoh's number one guy, don't you know, his wife was smoking hot. And she thought that Joseph was incredibly handsome. And she, time and time again, threw herself in front of him. Don't you know she dressed the part? Don't you know she did everything she could to capture his heart, to capture his attention, but he would resist and resist and resist. And one day she grabbed him and she demanded that he sleep with her. And Joseph said no. And he ran. He ran for his life. I wonder if lust is lingering in your world. I wonder, how are you doing in the area of lust? I mean, the day and age that we live, I mean, whether it's our phones, whether it's our screens, whether it's our neighbor, whether it's our coworkers, lust is always present, right? That spirit of lust. How do you say no to lust when lust is screaming yes? Well, I'll tell you how. You do what Joseph did. Joseph said, He said, your husband has trusted me with everything. You're the only thing that I can't touch. And then he says this, how could I do this and commit this great sin against God? And he runs for his life. Listen, if the enemy is tempting you to commit adultery, tempting you to have sex outside of marriage, tempting you to continue giving in to the battle of lust, maybe through pornography or the way that you look at the opposite sex. Can I just give you a little um, little word here? Chances are that if you pause to consider, then actually what you're doing is you're planning to commit. Let me say it again. If you pause to consider like, ah, oh, should I or shouldn't I? If you pause to consider, then you're actually planning to commit and it will happen just like that. So do what Joseph did and run and he runs. And then you know what she does? She lies. She screams bloody murder. Her husband comes home, Potiphar comes home and she says, the slave that you brought in here, the slave that you brought in here, look what Joseph did. He tried to rape me. And when I screamed, he took off running and I have his coat here to prove it. And Potiphar is, oh, he is furious. So not only does she mistreat Joseph, not only did all of his brothers mistreat Joseph, And by the way, you know what they did? They took that coat of many colors, that beautiful robe, and they killed an animal and they dipped it in blood and they sent it back to his father and said, said, here, we found this. And Jacob says, oh my gosh, a wild animal must have killed my son. They didn't say that. He came to that conclusion, right? Because they misled him to that conclusion. You know, sometimes a lie is not just in what we say, but in what we set up for others to believe. And not only had his brothers wronged him, now she has wronged him, and now Potiphar's going to wrong him. And he takes him and he throws him into prison. He throws him into prison. And don't you know, he beat him up. I mean, don't you know, he messed him up. And then scripture says that Potiphar himself threw him into prison, furious. And what's crazy is we pick up in Genesis 39, but the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. 
Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all of the other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. The warden had no worries because Joseph took care of everything. The Lord was with him and caused everything he did to succeed. And it wasn't long before two other guys get thrown into prison. Now, one was a butler and one was a baker for Pharaoh. And this is important because God, we're talking about God's plan and and God's plan is always in alignment with his purpose. God, as a story unfolds, and it looks like Joseph is completely forgotten. No, no, God hadn't forgotten him, and God hasn't forgotten you. So in the middle of your mess, whether that mess is your family, you're going through a family mess right now. Maybe it's your marriage. You're going through marital mess. Maybe it's your finances, and you're going through financial mess right now. Maybe it's social. Maybe it's your social life, and it's things with friends, and right now it's just a mess. Maybe it's your grades at school and your grades, or maybe it's a relationship with a coach or a teacher or a mentor, and it just seems like, man, my dating life, my social life, my married life, you know, in my parenting, I have a mess on my hands. Maybe it seems like your mess is so big and God has forgotten about you, but what we see is there's purpose in your painful mess, just like there was with Joseph. And now this butler and baker that are thrown in there, they both have a dream. Now God is the giver of dreams. The same God that gave Joseph dreams gives this butler and gives this baker a dream and they they're 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 uh, they're upset they're they're worried and Joseph sees them and he can tell by their faces right he can tell looking at them that something's wrong and he says to him he says why are you upset I can tell something's bothering you why are you upset and what I love here is that Joseph just by looking at their faces can see So he's discerning, but then he also is concerned about them. And he asks, what's wrong? How can I help you? And they say, we have these dreams. And Joseph says, well, God is the dream giver. And God is also the one to interpret dreams. Tell me your dream and God can interpret it. So they both tell their dream. Well, you know what happens? Joseph tells them their dream. And he says, here's what your dream means. And it happened just like Joseph said. In fact, he said, in three days, you're going to be summoned in front of Pharaoh. And he told the butler, who was the cupbearer, he said, you're going to serve Pharaoh again. And that was good. And when the baker heard the good report, he said, interpret my dream. And he said, it's not going to go well with you. Pharaoh is going to have you killed. And sure enough, later, sure enough, three days later, it's Pharaoh's birthday. And Pharaoh says, you know what? You know what? This party's missing. I want my butler and I want my baker. Come back on out here. And they bring him out of prison. They put him back in front of Pharaoh. And and the butler serves Pharaoh his wine again. And then Pharaoh says, you are restored to your position. And then Pharaoh turns and he looks at the baker and he says, you know what I'm going to do? For you, I'm going to kill you. That's going to be a birthday present to me. Now, I don't know all the story there, but evidently there was a story there. And Pharaoh has him killed. And it happened just like Joseph had interpreted because God is not only the giver of dreams, but God is the giver of interpretation of dreams. And Joseph had said to both of them, hey, don't forget me. Don't forget me. When you get out there, don't forget me. Well, guess what? The butler forgot all about him. And now some time had passed and someone else has a dream. Pharaoh has a dream. In fact, he has two dreams and he summons all the magicians. He summons all the wise men in all of Egypt and no one can interpret his dream. And then God causes the butler, the cupbearer, to remember Joseph. And the butler says to Pharaoh, Today, I'm reminded of my failure. I'm reminded that there was a man in prison who took care of us and who interpreted dreams. Pharaoh, you need him to interpret your dreams. So sure enough, 
it's exactly what happens. Pharaoh summons for Joseph to get out of prison and to come to him. And the scripture tells us that Joseph shaves, he changes his clothes, he summoned. I mean, he has been in prison, guys, for 13 years. 13 years. 13 years. He was done wrong by his brothers. They mistreated him. He was done wrong by Potiphar's wife. She lied about him. He was done wrong by her husband. He beat him up and threw him in prison. And he's left for a period of 13 years to be punished for doing right. But scripture tells us over and over again, God was with him. And now all of a sudden he is right in front of Pharaoh the most powerful man in all the world. And Pharaoh tells him his dreams. And Pharaoh says this, and I'll read a couple verses. These verses won't be on the screen. In just a little bit, we'll have some verses on the, on the screen. But Pharaoh tells him the dream. And this is how Joseph responds. He says, it is beyond my power to do this. Notice his humility. It's beyond my power to do this, Joseph replied, but God can tell you what it means and set you at ease. And then Joseph, in verse 25 of chapter 41, he says, both of Pharaoh's dreams mean the same thing. God is telling Pharaoh in advance what he is about to do. The seven healthy cows and the seven healthy heads of grain both represent seven years of prosperity. The seven thin scrawny cows that came up and ate that came up later and the seven thin heads of grain that were withered by the east wind, they represent seven years of famine. So you had seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. And Pharaoh's dream was the seven big cows came up and then out of the water, seven um, scrawny cows and the seven scrawny cows ate up the fat cows and then grain. Seven, man, great bundles of big uh, uh, fat grain and then then this little scrawny grain and the scrawny grain ate up the fat grain. And he says, hey, hey, these mean the same thing. And what it means is you're going to have seven years of prosperity and then seven years of famine. And the famine's going to be so bad that we will forget all the prosperity. We'll forget the seven years of prosperity. And so he goes on and he tells, he says this, he says, these decre- these events have been decreed by God and God need, God will make it happen. And then fast forward. And he says, Pharaoh, you need to pick somebody. You need to pick someone that is wise and intelligent and, and can take one fifth of all the food these first seven years and store it away. And he just lays out a plan right in front of Pharaoh. He lays out an amazing plan. And Pharaoh's like, oh my goodness. He's, he says to all his rulers and all his wise men, He says, can we think of anyone better than this guy? Anyone more, I mean, more fit for this position than Joseph? And they all agree. Why? Because God had given Joseph favor. And God can do the same for you. In the middle of your mess, in the middle of my mess, maybe 13 years later, maybe it takes a while for us to get through the mess. But now all of a sudden, you know what happens? It's crazy. Pharaoh changes Joseph's name and he says, I'm going to give you a new name. Your new name is going to be Zaphanath Paniah. And you know what that name means? It means God speaks and God lives like El Shaddai God, like, like God Almighty. And now Joseph's whole world changes now he is in put, he's put in charge of all, all of Egypt. He is number two. There's no one else more powerful than Joseph except for Pharaoh. Pharaoh takes off his ring, his signet ring, and he hands it and puts it on Joseph's finger. He gives him his ring of authority. He, he um, gives him brand new wardrobe. He gives him a brand new gold gold chain. I mean, he's got some bling. This huge gold chain is put around Joseph's neck by Pharaoh. And he gives him a special 
chariot with an announcement that whenever Joseph rides in that chariot, someone announces, kneel down, or watch this, bow down. Everywhere he goes, people are bowing down. And remember, remember chapter 37, that was his dream. The moon, the stars, the sun, it, they all bow down to me. All my brothers, all my family bow down to me. And now it's beginning to happen. And it doesn't go to his head. But instead, Joseph did what he said, and Joseph works hard, and he begins to save the grain, because not only was Egypt going to experience a famine, but all the world was going to experience a famine, and people would come from all over, and God's purpose is now being revealed in God's plan. Why did God allow all this to happen? Why did he allow his brothers to be mean to him? Why did he allow him to be thrown in his cistern? Why did he allow him to be sold to the Ishmaelites? Why did he allow him to be put in prison? Now we're seeing it all come together. And here is Joseph and he is in charge. He's large and in charge. And Pharaoh not only gives him a new name and gives him all these things, but he gives him a wife, a beautiful wife. And during the um, during this seven years of prosperity, um, Joseph has two sons and he names them Manasseh, which means causing to forget. And he says, God is causing me to forget all my pain. So just like all of a sudden his world fell apart, all of a sudden God is restoring him, just like we read about with Job, right? That, that there is purpose in our painful mess. And the second boy, not only does he have one boy, man, and God causes me to forget all my pain, but the second one, his name was Ephraim, which means fruitful. Now all of a sudden, God is blessing me. There's fruit like crazy. God is multiplying my life. Things are getting better. And maybe that's where you're at. Maybe you're coming through a divorce. Maybe you're coming out of a divorce. Maybe you're still suffering in the middle of this divorce, and you're wondering like, God, it hurts so bad. When will it get better? Maybe that's your finances. Maybe it's with your kids. Maybe you got some teenagers right now and they are full, I mean, full out rebellious and you are not sleeping and you are hurting. Maybe you've lost a relative from cancer or COVID and you're in the middle of your grief and you're wondering why, God, why? And can I just remind you that in the middle of this painful mess, God will allow his purpose to surface. Now, this is where the story picks up. Oh, it gets so good. And this is where we, we end. All right, so here's Joseph. Well, guess what? Joseph's brothers, they're back in Israel and they run out of food. And so Jacob, Joseph's father and his brother's father say, hey, he says, go and get food, take money, take all these gifts and bring us back something to eat. Your father's starving. We're all going to starve. And so sure enough, they go. And when they come, guess who they see? Joseph. Guess what they do? Bow. They bow to their brother, just like Joseph's dream. And not once and not twice and not three times. I read at least four different times that they end up bowing and this is what happens. So they come and he treats them a little uh, rough. He's harsh with them, but remember they could never say a kind word about him. So Joseph is a little harsh with them and he's like, I think you're spies, you're spies. And he asks questions and he asks questions. Do you have a father? Do you have a brother? Well, we know why I asked those questions. And they said, yes, we have a father and we have one other brother. He's the very youngest. His name's Benjamin. And our father wouldn't let him come because we lost our other brother and uh, he's holding on to him. And, and Joseph says, this is what I want. I want you to go home and I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep one of you here. And he picked Simeon. He said, I'm going to keep you here and you're going to be my slave until y'all go home and bring back your other brother. And they said, we just want to buy grain. And he said, I promise you, I promise you on the authority of Pharaoh and the authority of me, you will not you will not get your brother back unless you come back with your youngest brother. So he says, all the grain you wanted to buy, it's yours. 
and they gave him money. You know what Joseph does? Joseph tells one of his servants, take the grain that they bought and then put all their money back in the sacks. And sure enough, so his brothers leave. So there were 12 brothers. You had minus two, Joseph and Benjamin. Joseph is in Egypt. Benjamin is back with dad. You had 10 brothers. One of them now is being held there as a as a prisoner. So these nine brothers are going home and along the journey, they stop. One of them stops to feed his donkey some grain and he opens up his sack and he finds his money and they're afraid. Oh my gosh, what do we do? And all their money was restored. Well, they go back, they tell their father, Jacob's like, there's no way, man. You guys are crazy. If you think I'm going to allow Benjamin to go back with you, you already lost Joseph. And I'm he, I, I'm already going to go to my grave grieving his death. You're not going to have my youngest son. And time went on. And finally, they beg him, they, dad, we're all going to die. We're all going to die. Please let us take. Please let us take Benjamin back with us. It's the only way he's going to allow us to come back and see us. And he says, okay, we'll not only take the money that they accidentally put back in your sacks, which was on purpose, purpose. That was Joseph being good to him. That was the goodness of Joseph. He said, but take twice the amount of money and take all these other gifts. And Judah, remember Judah, who was like, hey, what's in it for us? Let's not kill him. Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. Judah speaks up and Judah says, dad, I promise you my life. Reuben speaks up, dad, I promise you, you can kill my sons if we don't bring Benjamin back. And now they come back and here they come. And when they come back, they're in front of Joseph. And scripture tells us that when Joseph sees Benjamin, and he sees his brothers, he breaks down, he leaves, and he cries. He cries, and he prepares a feast for them. And out of that feast, he gives Benjamin extra. And his brothers are all eating, and Joseph sits them according to their age. And he can understand all that they're saying. And they're saying, oh, they're, they're nervous. Like, oh, God's doing this to us because of what we did to Joseph. And then Joseph sends them home. But get this. This is where the story finishes. He sends them back. And when he sends them back, he sends them with all the grain. And he sends them with his cup. Now, that cup was really important. He sends them with a silver cup. And he puts it in Benjamin's bag. And he tells them, he tells them, you know, you guys go back, you guys go back, and and um, they load up and they head out. And then all of a sudden, when they start on their way, when they start on their way, guess what? Here comes the army. And they track them down and they said, how in the world could you guys treat us like this when we've been so good to you? How could you steal my master's cup, Joseph's cup, his silver cup, the one that was predict used to predict the future? And so they're like, we promised my Lord, none of us did that. And, and may whichever one of us, whoever's bag has it in there, you can, you can take him and you can keep him. You could kill him, do with him, whatever you want. But none of us did that. And they all open their sacks. And then all of a sudden, the silver cup, Joseph's silver cup comes out of Benjamin's bag. And they all are filled with dread. And they're taken back. And they are put in front of Joseph. And the brothers that did him wrong all of a sudden speak up and speak out. And this is, we pick this up in chapter 44. And Judah speaks up for his brothers and he tells the story of how they wronged Joseph. And right after he speaks up for his brothers, Joseph, man, Joseph begins crying. And Joseph reveals his identity. Genesis chapter 45, verse 1. Now, here's the story. 
Let's go to Genesis 50. You will have these verses on the screen. Let's go to Genesis chapter 50. We're going to read 15 through 21. Watch this. So he tells them who he is. He asks about his father. He proves to him, I'm Joseph, him and Benjamin, who are their um, complete blood brothers, not half brothers or step brothers. They hug each other, they weep. And then Joseph and also Pharaoh speaks up and says, hey, go get your father and all your families. Come back here, live here in Egypt, and you will have the best. I promise you, you will have the best of everything Egypt has. And this was during the middle of the famine. Now, God has been so good to Joseph. And so Joseph's father comes back. They're reunited. Jacob and Joseph, they cry, they weep. Don't you know that embrace? I mean, that's like a movie. They cry and they weep. And then after that, Jacob dies. And when Jacob dies, all his brothers are like, oh, this goodness, I mean, Joseph being so kind to us, it's going to come to an end. He's going he's gonna to get back to us for what we did to him. Genesis 50, let's go verse 15. But now after their father was dead, Joseph's brothers became fearful. Now Joseph will show his anger and pay us back for all the wrong that we did to him, they said. So they sent this message, message to Joseph. Before your father died, he instructed us to say to you, please forgive your brothers for the great wrong they did to you, for their sin in treating you so cruelly. So we, the servants of the God of your father, beg you to forgive our sin. When Joseph received this message, he broke down and he wept. Then his brothers came and they threw themselves down before Joseph. Fourth time, they're bowing down before Joseph. Look, we're your slaves, they said. But Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? Because you and I, when people do us wrong, what is human nature? We want to get back at them, don't we? But Joseph replied, verse 19, but Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? Verse 20, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all, here it is, for good. He brought me to this prison so I could save the lives of many people. No, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. So he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. You know what he told him? He said, you sold me, but God sent me. You sold me, but God sent me. I wonder where in your life it looks like you were sold. Someone sold you out, maybe a business partner, and you were done wrong, and you were mistreated. And it was like, you sold me, but actually, just like Joseph, it was like God's purpose prevailed. God sent me. Can I tell you today that even when you can't see the hand of God, you and I can trust his heart. And I also want to say that even when we doubt, like when in doubt, we can trust God to work it out. There's purpose in your mess. Joseph, 13 years in prison for something that he didn't do, for something that shouldn't have happened. And he's mistreated all this time, but he allows God's purpose to prevail. And now at the age of 30, he is able to save the country. He's able to save his family. And he's able to forgive. Here's the question I want to ask you as we close this entire series, Address the Mess. Maybe some of this mess isn't your fault. It's not your fault fault. Someone else did you wrong. And the pain and the hurt and the loss and the sleepless nights all remind you that it's them. The question is, will you forgive them? Will you be like Joseph and forgive them. The question is, will you forgive those who mistreated you? 
because Joseph had a whole lot of people that mistreated him. But he said, hey, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. And we know that all things work together for our good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. His purpose. We all have a mess. God is in the middle of our mess. God is bigger than our mess. But there is purpose in your painful mess. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I want to ask you right now, how many of you would say, wow, <laughs> Pastor Tim, that's, it's like you read my mail. That's, that speaks to me. That's exactly, I mean, it relates exactly to me. That's, that's my story. And there's a mess here. And the mess is my fault. I'm paying for someone else's mess. I'm suffering for someone else's mess. I keep trying to do right. The more I try to do right, it seems like the worse things get. In fact, they've gone from bad to worse. Would you just trust God? Would you just trust God that there is purpose in your painful mess? If so, can I pray for you? God, I pray for all those right now who's sitting there and are watching and god they identify with this message they identify with the the confusion they identify with the pain they identify with the brokenness they identify with this kind of mess that often looks like that it's because of others that this happened to us but when we look at it and get your perspective we see that it wasn't happening to us. It was actually happening for us. Would you help them, I pray, to have that perspective? Maybe like Joseph for 13 years, maybe this has been going on for more than a decade. God, I pray you give them the grace to help them realize that there is purpose even in our painful mess. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, now listen, we never like to end a gathering without giving you an opportunity to say yes to Christ, to allow Jesus to forgive your sins and to make you new. You see, Jesus not only died on the cross so that we could be forgiven of our sins and go to heaven. That's exactly why he died. But he also died on that cross and rose again so that you and I could have life right now. We could have life and have it abundantly. The Bible teaches us that we're all sinners. Everyone has sinned, and because of our sin, the payment is death. That's the bad news, but there's good news. The good news is that God loves you so much that God bankrupted heaven by sending his son as a sacrifice for our sins. And with the blood of Jesus... Our sins can be washed away, gone forever. It's not about being good. That's not how we get to heaven. How how good is good enough? It's about being forgiven. And the truth is that if you will put your faith and trust in Christ, that he died for you, he bled for you, he was buried for you, and he rose again for you, and you'll put your faith and trust in, in God's gift, which is Jesus. That's how we're forgiven of our sins, and that's how Jesus becomes our Savior. If you've never done it, I want to lead us in a prayer right now. I want to lead us in a prayer, and I want to encourage you to pray this prayer with me. If you're watching online, if you're watching in our gathering right now, I'm going to lead you in the sinner's prayer. Scripture says that if we will confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if we'll believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And this in the end, this is the beginning. And if you've never done this, you don't need to do this. You know, you don't need to just do this. So man, you know, um, I can be a better person. No, you need to do this because you are dead in your sins. 
and Jesus bled for you, and he died for you, and he rose for you, so you and I could trade places with him and experience the forgiveness that only comes because of his grace and mercy. I'm going to lead us in this prayer right now. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? You're watching online. You pray this prayer out loud with us. You're not praying to me. You're not praying through me. Well, I'm just going to lead us in this prayer. We're going live. You're praying right now to God. Would you say, Jesus, I confess I'm a mess. And today I address my mess. I am a sinner. And I need a Savior. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for bleeding for me. Thank you for dying for me. And thank you for rising again for me. I give you my life. I receive your life. Now teach me how to live. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Listen, if you did that, we're going to celebrate with you. The way we do it in our gatherings is we clap. And I want you to raise your hand. I'm going to ask you for four seconds of courage. I'm going to ask you to hold your hand up high. Don't be shy. Hold it up high. That's right. I want you to hold it up very, very high. I want you to hold it up high on the count of three. And then we're going to clap for you. And then if you're watching online, you see the number right there on the screen. I want you to text us, Jesus made me new on that number. Ready? Here we go. On the count of three, let us know. Ready? One, two, three. That's right. That's right. Yes. I'm so proud of you. I am so proud of you. That is awesome. Come on, church. Let's celebrate. That is so awesome. That's right. Hold it up high. Hold it up high. That's right. Text us on that number. Jesus made me new. That's the greatest decision that you can ever make. And today, we celebrate that decision that you made. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for watching. Right now, we're gonna turn it over to one of our leaders at our campus or one of our leaders online. I love you guys. Thanks so much. I hope you enjoyed this series and you don't wanna miss the next one. It's gonna be incredible. I'll see you next week. God bless you.